Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number. I am going to completely and totally guess 428 of the Daily Beat Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yay! Today, recording day, is Thursday, July 18th, 2024. And as you can tell by the sun on my face coming through the window, it is a very beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. And it's been a little warm. Um, I'm your host, the Eagle Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And not with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, who is, of course, on vacation and... Uh, even though he has been on vacation, has been coming in to produce the show uh, yesterday uh, from a parking lot uh, just uh, in, in beautiful British Columbia, just uh, near the Alberta border. Um, and uh, I am guessing uh, that he probably wanted, uh, well, whether voluntary or involuntary, either couldn't get to a place where he can connect or uh, decided that he needed some additional sleep so we are definitely not going to begrudge him that. Uh, I sent him a little message uh, seeing if he was there, but he has not been in touch, so he might not also might not have service. Um, so we're flying solo today, kits and cubs. Uh, and um, we got thrown another curveball because uh, went and I logged into the production uh, software because normally I just log in. Mr. Grizzly produces everything, so he's running the production software, and then I link into this one. So today I'm running the production software, uh, but I don't have all the things he has in it. I don't have the lead into the show and the bumpers and all that kind of stuff, which is why we started the way we did. Uh, and as I was coming in, there was a little notice that said, um, starting July 14th, restream in order to broadcast live to Twitter, or now X, but Twitter, um, you now need a premium subscription with Twitter, which we do not have. And I'm not sure we are particularly inclined to have in one way. Um, in another way, I mean, Twitter is where our business kind of gets done. Uh, so it's where the news and media happens to to live. So you kind of have to be there. Um, so in one sense, it makes uh, kind of makes it. I mean, there's an expression in French that goes le choix s'impose that the choice imposes itself. That you probably kind of have to pay it. Um, but I am very, very, very uncomfortable with being forced to be given to give money to a, a certain someone. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted. I am definitely conflicted. Uh, I think the service is working on something to try to fix that, to make it easier for us that Restream is trying to find a way to make sure reach a deal with X, uh, cause it was also mentioning that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I don't know if we have to do it ourselves or the network is going to have to do it or something, but, uh, yes, for the next little while, we're not broadcasting directly through X because there's a change in the payment system, it seems. So uh, right now you can find us through our Facebook page. That's where we're broadcasting live, and I posted the links to that to our Twitter feed. But uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's where we are. And uh, they keep on being listed as a blackballed casual Friday, but it's not about the blackballed casual Friday. It is the Daily Beaver Morning Show. Um, so I don't know how to change that. <laughs> I don't even know where it's written <laughs> to figure it out. Uh, so uh, we're MacGyvering it, we're doing the best we can, but we are trying to get a show to you. And uh, that's uh, the most important part. Uh, there we go. Uh, we do have a couple of kits who have found us. Kit Linda M., good morning to you. And uh, Kit, uh, um, Ka I'm going to guess this is Cassie, uh, but I'm seeing a different name. Uh, on um, uh, appearing on my screen because everybody uh, who is uh, participating on the chat is doing it through Facebook and through our uh, our link on the Facebook page today. Uh, but uh, so they might not have the same handles as uh, 
um, through YouTube or otherwise. But uh, good morning to you. Yes, it is. Okay, good. I guessed correctly. Um, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining me uh, this way. Uh, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. <sighs> and uh, I'm not going to ask how Mr. Grizzly's health is doing, mental health is doing today. Uh, mine is um, up and down. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, things have been a little heavy up late. Um, yesterday, th th things were better um, in that sense. Uh, but I went out to, to play tennis, and uh, shortly after, um, uh, I wasn't feeling well. It was like I had a stomach bug of some sort. Um, but I'm not quite exactly sure what. Uh, I'm wondering now, maybe, because uh, I did play tennis yesterday afternoon, and it was a, um, it, it was a battle. It was a battle. By the end, I had very little left. It was just like hitting the ball, like, Ugh. <laughs> and hoping it would go over the net. So I don't know if I may have uh, overexhausted myself or overheated or something, and maybe that did it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, was not feeling good, uh, the rest of the day, uh, had to stay home, uh, from going out and spending some time with some friends and, uh, somewhere, uh, in the evening after my beaver sweetie came home from spending time with friends that I was supposed to be at, um, I apparently stretched out on the couch and fell asleep until about five something this morning. And I actually do not remember actually having stretched out on the couch. So, uh, yeah, wasn't feeling good. Uh, feeling great this morning, uh, which is very interesting. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I've got a little bit of bad news this morning, but not terrible news, but bad news. Um, Craig uh, Baird, who's the host of uh, Canadian History A, happens to be in Ottawa this week. He's uh, doing a tour of a whole bunch of things, and he's going to have some great content for his show. And uh, I'm not that far away, so I was planning to hop a bus today to uh, go and spend some time with him. But uh, he is a very busy man. He's got interviews and uh, more tour guides and visits and a 5.30 a.m. flight tomorrow morning. So uh, it's not going to happen today. It is postponed uh, till October when he'll be returning. Um, so I'm a little sad because, you know, I really, 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 really was looking forward to meeting him live and in person. He's, uh, uh, I love his content. Uh, he's been a guest on our show a few times. Um, he's, he's just delightful. Um, so I was very much looking forward to having some time, uh, spend some time, hang out time and, uh, maybe have dinner and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but unfortunately it cannot be today. So it is merely, uh, as we say in French, uh, uh, partie remise. So it's uh, it's merely postponed until uh, until uh, another time, and it will be only sweeter then. <laughs> so um, let's get to the show because I think I've talked your ear off too much. Uh, it's already about uh, the personal stuff and the behind the scenes show stuff. <laughs> um. Interesting day news. Uh, things have sort of um, states, well, let's start with, we normally start with, with wildfires and water, why not? Not too many developments uh, on that, new developments uh, to report today uh, in everything news that I had listened to so far. Uh, nothing on those issues stood out, so I assume that uh, it's status quo uh, at the moment. Um. So we don't have too much on natural disasters. Uh, with regard to the what is being called an assassination attempt, it seems, because uh, yesterday I was wondering, how do you call it an assassination attempt when you don't have uh, much information as it pertains to motive? Um, but it seems that that's a standard thing uh, when someone is shot at. It's assumed to be an assassination attempt so that take care that takes care of that uh, you don't need details uh, on motive in order to be able to describe it that way according to uh, what is industry strand if you could call it industry to what is standard practice um so that part uh, that that part's pretty much taken care of for me that way 
Um, there seems to not be that much more information with regard to motive. It seems that investigators were able to get access um, to his phone. Uh, and uh, there's a very little social media presence. Um, there's not that much to go on. There was a meeting with lawmakers. Uh, they got a briefing. Uh, there are certain things that leaked out from that. Um, one of them is that um, there's a, possibly some speculation uh, that he was suffering from a major uh, mental health disorder uh, or that he was looking up stuff on his phone with regard to a major uh, mental disorder uh, that could be something related to manic depression. Uh, it's, there seems to be nothing out there confirming whether or not he was diagnosed with or he was just searching for information on. But there's something there that has uh, an element. Um, there's the other element is that the search of his phone indicates that he did searches not only of um, the RNC, but also the DNC uh, conference, and that there were images of both Biden and Trump on his phone. Uh, and according to ABC News, uh, this says the suspected gunman in the assassination attempt of Donald Trump last Saturday searched on his phone for the dates of the former president's rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, and for dates of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Sources familiar with the investigation told ABC News. He also searched on his phone for images of both the former president and current president. Uh, the suspect's phone search history revealed no indication of his political views. Um, so it is kind of looking like uh, whatever initial narratives people wanted to spin may not be working in this case. Uh, if we also add the fact that uh, when the shooting happened, um, he was wearing uh, a T-shirt uh, from um, a YouTube channel specifically uh, that had something to do uh, with uh, weapons and ammunition. Um, you put that all together, there could be... The odds are more likely, even though there is nothing confirmed, that the that it may not be a strictly political motive at play here. Exactly, as Kit Linda says here, uh, just because the result of an act is political doesn't mean the motive was political. So this one might be uh, for the people that want to run with stuff. You know, use this in whatever the way to twist it and torque it to push their narrative. Uh, it might be harder to do with this one. Um, so that's about the major developments. The only other thing that came out, uh, there was some interviewing, uh, not some interviewing, but some reporting from the BBC uh, that uh, mentioned that a shooter had tried to get on uh, the high school varsity shooting team, rifle team, when he was there. Uh, he tried out once and uh, apparently uh, did not make the team and never tried out again. I tried out again and it was people from his graduating class that they talked to and they uh, basically described him um, as a terrible shot. Um, so 
Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, with regards to um, Donald Trump, uh, there is lots of questions now as to why it is there is no information released um, well, there was no medical, no information released with from uh, the physician, the White House physician, with regard to his medical condition, given he was shot, right? And that the bullet uh, allegedly uh, grazed his ear and maybe took a little piece off it. Um, he came with that uh, big package on his ear that, you know, been joking, looks like a maxi pad which, of course, prompted me to wonder if it had wings. Because, <laughs> you know, couldn't help myself. Uh, but, uh, and then you're seeing a um, whole bunch of really um, interesting memes uh, going out uh, of people making fun of it. Uh, some of them are saying that uh, uh, NASA has reported... Uh, that they were able to see it from space or um, stuff like this. Hopefully I can do this for you and put it on screen. I think I can. Or uh, the guy has a diaper over his head and uh, says, nicked myself shaving. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you knew that was kind of coming. Uh, People are showing uh, actual images on the line of what an actual ear dressing looks like, uh, as opposed to his. And they are also um, saying, uh, again, this is lots of conspiracy stuff, right? Um, so how would I put it? Cause I, I don't want to push the conspiracies. Um, there is debate as to whether or not he was actually hit by the bullet or whether or not the bullet may have hit and hit teleprompter plexiglass. And that may have gone up and may have been cut with a shard of glass. Uh, or something else, right? Um, we don't know. We don't know. But when you add, people are saying that the way that the blood looked made it look like it was something else. I'm not an expert. I don't know. I don't know if that's the thing to go on or that's the thing to, to not. The fact that there's nothing there wasn't anything medical, apparently. The doctor did come out and say something, but that there is no medical document circulating. The irony being that, um, uh, of course, I, I would turn around and say, um, because um, do we have his long form medical report? <clears throat> anyway, uh, but yes, that nothing's out there, you know. Add that to the blood splatter, add that to the fact that apparently before he came out on the first night of the RNC convention, uh, he was seen out and about with no bandage or dressing on his ear as well. Um, it's leading people to speculate. Now, the, I, I can, again, this is pure speculation here. Um, if it was shrapnel of some kind, then it would be very clear that they would not want to release an official medical report um, because, well, that would not allow for the he took a bullet narrative to stand. He took a bullet for America, he took a bullet for you, to come in for you, but I'm the one standing in their way. Look, I even took a bullet for you. Um, that doesn't change the fact that he was shot at. Somebody tried to take his life. 
doesn't diminish that. If you want to milk something, there's enough of that to milk without having to overplay the hand that he took a bullet if he wasn't touched by a bullet, especially since three other people were touched by bullets. Two were critically injured and one was dead. One is dead. And the one who was dead, even though he was at a Trump rally and even though you look at his social media and there are certain things that would make an eyebrow or two raise up, as we mentioned on the show, he's a person, he's a father. His husband, he threw himself on his family to protect them. Shit got real. Right? So, I'm not sure what it is. There was a plot twist that happened yesterday that makes the medical record thing, brings it up in more prominence. Because as if this timeline wasn't weird enough. And when I'm saying wasn't weird enough, like I mean really weird. All right. Let's put it this way. Yesterday, there was this uh, person that goes uh, by Olivia Juliana on Twitter and said, posted this, just in the past hour, Bob Menendez is resigning. He's a Democratic senator who just got found guilty, I think on 18 counts related to fraud and bribery from New Jersey in Joe Biden's weaponized against the Republicans justice system. Democratic senator was just found guilty. Uh, the Trump shooter also allegedly planned to target the DNC. That language, I'm not sure if he planned to target, but was looking at dates. The foreign minister of Russia praised J.D. Vance. And Biden tested positive for COVID. We already have more information in the public sphere about Biden's health with regard to being diagnosed with COVID than we do about Trump's ear in an alleged assassination attempt. That's not normal. Had this not happened, the story about no medical stuff about Trump would probably go away in a couple of days, but not with juxtaposition. So it becomes a little more prominent. Um, there were some images yesterday also of uh, Joe Biden um, getting out of, I guess, whatever car he was being driven in to get to a plane to go back home to Delaware. And um, he was not wearing a mask. And, you know, just that one was kind of a layup, Joe. Probably should have done that. There were you know, other people around you helping you to get back to where you needed to be to be in isolation. And that was, you know, you know, if you're going to do the messaging, you got to do the messaging, man. Especially when you're infected. Uh, that was a bit of a thing that caught a lot of people's attention as well. Um, Susan Delacourt, upon hearing this, said, this is when your editor of political fiction sends you back the manuscript and says, quote, come on, you're stretching credulity here. <laughs> and it's true. It really is true. Um, just when you think the timeline can't get weirder, weirder, it really is dead. And just to go on top of that, because Susan Delacourt said, right, this is when you call your fiction writer, your, your, the editor, uh, if you're a fiction writer, uh, an actual fiction writer, Peggy Blair, uh, one of Canada's uh, most um, respected and beloved uh, crime fiction writers uh, sets her stories in Canada as well, often 
and uh, there apparently I have not read one myself, uh, but from everything I've been reading about her, um, people just love her stuff, and uh, hopefully we will have her on the show one day. Uh, but according to her, she wrote, Dear 2024, I have, reviewed, I have reviewed your manuscript with interest and regret to advise that I will be declining representation. While the plot is interesting, it strikes me that there is a little too much of it. I fear that readers will become overwhelmed. The idea of the president facing potential removal because of his age is certainly a unique approach. However, I feel that the reader should have had a chance to see that develop somewhat more before introducing the Epstein subplot. That in itself could have carried the entire book. However, it was immediately supplanted by your chapters outlining an attempted assassination of the former president. Unfortunately, this part of the manuscript, which we have set on the eve of the Republican convention, lacks sufficient detail to be plausible. For example, you provide no explanation as to how the Secret Service failed to notice the shooter on the roof for 30 minutes or have not provided the kind of medical details that help give us this kind of story the ring of truth. The plot twist where the aging president comes down with COVID in the middle of this chaos is simply one turn too many for the event, for even the most diligent reader to absorb. The vague references to Project 2025 throughout the manuscript simply muddy the waters instead of adding attention to the conflict. I was left not knowing exactly what the story was supposed to be or where it was headed at any given moment. For this reason, I do not feel I will be able to find a publisher for your work. Another agent may feel differently. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, if you're sitting at home and you're thinking, oh, come on, really? And the thing with Biden is that he had just done a speech to the NAACP, which I did watch, uh, where he, one of his, well, for an 80-year-old man, a typical barn burner for Joe Biden. For Joe Biden, he was knocking it out. You know, he had touched on all the issues. You know, the interviews with people that were in the room after was they were glowing. Um, you know, any doubts I have have been erased. You know, it's like he spoke to so many of our issues that there's you know, and spoke to them well and adequately and substantively that there's like no way he could be in cognitive decline. You know, that type of stuff. Um, so, and, you know, polling numbers were starting to go, starting to go his way. Um, there's an aggregator, I think in the United States, the equivalent, I, uh, 538, I'm not, not sure what it's called, but, uh, uh, they run simulations 100 times and they run election scenarios and, uh, it's like they have like Biden winning 54 times out of a hundred, uh, which is slightly up than it was. So everything that they've been saying, like since the debate, oh my God, Biden's dead, and it didn't really move the needle that much. And then the Trump assassination attempt to turn around, well, that's it, Trump has won. I guess didn't, because Trump is not a sympathetic figure. And you're in the United States with a rather rogue Supreme Court that doesn't even want, wants to, impose the law on everyone else, but doesn't even want a legalized mandated ethical code imposed on it. You have, yes, thank you, Kit Linda 538. That's the name of the, the, the service. Um, you have, and then this most recent decision that said, you know, yes, while the constitution says that the president can be impeached for uh, uh, high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, the president also cannot commit any high crimes and misdemeanors. And if the president does commit crimes, um, then uh, in order to prove a crime, you have to prove motive, opportunity, and means. And uh, we're not going to allow you to introduce any uh, information as to motive or evidence. So basically, they've created a system where the president can't be found guilty of anything, and then uh, because he's the president, uh, and he has absolute immunity for things that are the core, that are related to the core constitutional duties, and uh, well, the presidential pardon, it's a core constitutional thing. So, gives an illegal order, 
nobody needs to refuse it because he can just turn around and say, well, you know, I'll pardon you. And then nobody can look into the pardon because that's absolute, absolute immunity. Now, of course, <clears throat> you have to be somebody that trusts that Donald Trump will follow through on the pardon because he certainly didn't help his friend Rudy, now did he? Just saying. That's another mess. And you may have seen uh, images of him at the RNC, kind of a, hmm, uh, having a little difficulty staying on his feet. But then again, he's had a couple of rough weeks. He's lost his show on ABC, and then in court, um, uh, he's been uh, told uh, he absolutely needs to pay up. And then again, he tried to uh, say that he's, uh, well, he's going to file for bankruptcy, and apparently uh, that was denied so uh, now they can start going after his personal assets. So, um, yeah. And, of course, um, the right to choice has been affected. And there are ballot measures. So th this is not normal times. You don't, the person uh, whose life someone tried to take is not typically a sympathetic figure. He is among the people who like him, but they were voting for him already. There might be some Republican voters that were planning to choose the couch who that might rouse enough. There might be some people who didn't vote before who might be roused enough by that, who might quietly subscribe to that, but not enough to go vote. That might now. Yeah, maybe. Um, but these big, big, huge events that people think, oh, well, this is going to swing the pendulum, they don't. The sides are so entrenched. There's only like about 10% in the middle that like considers themselves some like swing down there. And it's not moving. It's, it's like we said on the show yesterday, uh, I'm not sure if it was yesterday, but uh, Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, the fact that he was shot at does not make it such that all of a sudden he was a good guy that had good policies and wanted the good for good. Everyone's good. Donald Trump is still Donald Trump, the same person he was before. He's still done all those things. Nothing gets washed away or absolved. But the fact he did all those things also does not justify someone shooting because political violence is never, ever, 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 ever the answer, ever, ever. trying to get rid of Donald Trump because he is politically violent. And you can transpose this to over here, to Canada. Right? We're seeing that violence movement. Nobody's stormed our equivalent of the Capitol yet. Nobody's gone to our equivalent of a conservative or a liberal convention and done that yet. Although we did talk the other day about uh, the attempt at uh, Pauline Marois a while ago, a couple of years ago. That was at a political event where everyone was gathered. So... But that kind of seething, bubbling under rage, that's being worked here too. As our Lisa, who makes those wonderful TikTok videos, says, uh, one of the big differences here is that we have a many fewer pew-pews. But we're not immune, and people are stoking these fires. Yeah. Kit Cassie, culture civil war is already active. For some people, yes. They are uh, 
They are living it. They are living it. And indeed, Kitlanda, even a civil war will make some people money. Yeah. War is good for some people financially. So, yeah. And if that wasn't enough in terms to get the rumor mills spinning when it comes to uh, what's going on in the United States, it seems that uh, President, well, another thing, of course, since we're talking about the violence, uh, it seems that uh, the next day or not too long after, uh, there's another person who died really at the convention uh, because there was a knife-wielding man near the Republican National Convention. Uh, it seems that it was someone who was uh, homeless or unhoused, depending uh, on what term we're using now. I, I'm not sure which, which one. Uh, and uh, it took the incident took place in the outer perimeter of the RNC within the operational zone to which uh, officers were assigned and these were officers from out of state that had been brought in to help. Um, so there's a lot of people upset by that specifically. Uh, quote, they came into our community and shot down our family right here at a public park, said Linda Sharp, a cousin of the man who was killed. What are you doing in our city shooting people down? Um, so yes, uh, it seems that uh, he, he was threatening someone. Uh, with the knife, uh, the man identified was identified as uh, Samuel Sharp, who was 43 years old, uh, living in a tent encampment near the site of the shooting. Body camera footage released by police show a large group of Columbus police officers in a circle being briefed on security matters in their assigned zone when one can be heard saying, he's got a knife. The camera turns to show an altercation between two individuals at the end of the parking lot where the group of 13 police officers were gathered. Hey, stop. One officer yelled, drop the knife. The group of officers can be heard repeatedly yelling as they ran over. When the armed man continued to move towards the unarmed man, police fired the weapons numerous times and the suspect fell to the ground. So uh, that's what was going on there. Uh, probably could possibly be totally unrelated. Could be its total own thing, uh, but happened in the area. So it, uh, it gets slumped in. Now, with uh, regard uh, to Biden, um, when I was talking about the health thing, uh, it seems that Biden went on the record before the COVID diagnosis <laughs> as saying that, um, because everybody's trying to get him to leave, uh, that pretty much only a, an illness he would consider it if there was an illness um, that would strike him. So uh, I think it is over, uh, uh, according to the USA Today, uh, Biden says only a medical condition would push him to consider dropping out of the race. And then all of a sudden there's a medical condition. Now, He's had, you know, his vaccines and all that kind of, all that good stuff. So, right, uh, hopefully everything will be all right. Uh, but, you know, people are going to be using this to feed in to the fact, um, you know, Biden is so old. There are some people that are trying to use it to try to explain away the debate performance. I think there might be too many days between um, for that to actually stick. but. Uh, yeah. You, there are still people that are having a harder time with COVID, um, even though you know we have treatments and stuff. Uh, even still today, even though the vaccines, right, to, to vaccinated or whatnot, doesn't necessarily mean how COVID is going to affect you when you get it. Is going to be the mild one even though it appears to be milder for, for most people now. Uh, now, President Biden has already had it once. Um, 
which might lead people to think that, well, if he's already had it once and did very well, he should be doing very well again. Yes, but there's also uh, data that seems to be indicating that successive exposures uh, could do more damage over time. So, but whatever it is, right? The whole narrative for the time that he's going to be in a way in an isolation, whatnot. See, he's so he's so frail, like this, and you're going to hear all the nasty stuff. She hope COVID doesn't get him, all that kind of stuff. Now, if he comes back in good health and all that kind of stuff, then he too again has a narrative, right? They both have a narrative of try of surviving something. So again, when you're playing it out in the court of public opinion and polling and whatnot, none of these events are going to swing things. as they would, you know, if we were still talking politics of the 1980s or 1990s, you know, when things like an affair were career ending. So, and we have a candidate who's an adjudicated rapist in civil court. Like somewhere Gary Hart must be going, really? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's about all that's going on from the mess over there. There was J.D. Vance, of course, that uh, gave his uh, speech uh, because uh, he was, you know, as a, as vice president, so he gave a speech uh, earlier on, I think it was the day before Nikki Haley gave hers, where she uh, the sellout was full and complete uh, because when she uh, pulled out of the race and everything for the convention was uh, put out she was not on the speakers list and then a couple of days before the convention uh, she stood up to the mic and said that she was releasing all of her 97 delegates and uh, encouraging them to vote Trump uh, this was after Trump mused aloud about uh, putting his political enemies in jail not sure if the two announcements were related uh, but uh, after she did that, all of a sudden she got in not only an invitation to attend the convention, uh, but to speak at it. And I'm guessing she probably got the invitation to speak so long as she threw her full support against Donald Trump. So despite all the things that she said about him when she was running against him, none of that is worse than a President Biden. So, um, so yeah, this, the, the sellout is uh, full and complete, along with the sta stage and speech on prime time delivered in HG, HD into the homes of people with her saying that, uh, yep, she's on Trump's team now. So, <sighs> kind of makes you wonder what it was all for, doesn't it? So yeah, um, you have J.D. Vance. And a lot of people are saying that choosing him was a mistake because he doesn't really add anything to the ticket. Uh, he does add one thing to the ticket, though. He's 39. In a sort of like, you know, overall global environment where everybody's talking about how everyone's so old because, I mean, like, Trump is only like three years younger than Biden. He's definitely way more senile. Um... So you have, for some people, looking at this election uh, as if it's a proxy election, starting to look at it between Kamala Harris and J.D. Vance, both of whom are significantly younger than each party's respective nominees. Or I should say prospective nominees, because Donald Trump will officially become the nominee tonight when he accepts it, and Joe Biden will be later. But um, uh, and it seems that J.D. Vance has not yet agreed to a to debate Kamala Harris. So, um, and then as we mentioned on the show before, uh, so you have uh, one side that is. Um, um, using the Joe Biden is so old narrative as a, um, um, how would you say it, as a, uh, um, a bullhorn 
or dog whistle, but more like a bullhorn for um, if he dies, you're going to have a black woman as president. My problem with Joe Biden's age is the color of Kamala Harris's skin. Or the chromosomes that she has. Or both. That's what it's basically boiling down to. And on the other side, when you have J.D. Vance, who, again, I really don't trust him. You got to get Kit Rian and go here. J.D. Vance is Putin's choice. I don't think Trump had an option for who would be his running mate. Um, quite possible. Quite possible. Um, but yeah, I, um, this J.D. Vance is concerned, like, he's concerning to me because I just have a very hard time believing that someone who is a never Trumper is now so all in that he would want to be his vice president after seeing what happened to the previous one, I mean, like, J.D., did you ask why the position is open? You should always ask why the position is open. Just saying. Um, so, um, and really he has one job, right? He has one job. It's when the election is over and Trump loses. And I know I should say if Trump loses, but I'd rather just say when he loses and hope that it manifests. Um, to go to the wall with whatever claim he's going to come up with at that point. Um, now, J.D. Vance changed all his values and all his beliefs in a pretty record time. Um, that's, to me, that strikes me as weird. To me, that was like, Donald, watch your back. Uh, this guy's a little too ambitious. You know that comment they usually make of women when they're running and they say that she's ambitious as if it's a bad thing? That applies to this one here. <laughs> this guy. Um, he is already on record uh, as being anti-abortion, anti-choice, and uh, this to an extent that is, um, like, I think not even in, um, not even in cases for rape or incest. He's on the record. He said that. And um, he also believes that women should stay in abusive relationships for the good of the children. He's also said that. So the Republicans clearly have uh, a very anti-women ticket. Which means that if they were actually facing Kamala Harris, they'd be looking to have one hell of a field day. Um, yeah. And, and, and let's not forget, again, that the head of that ticket has been found liable in civil court of sexual assault. And then defaming the person who accused him of it. Not once but twice. Yeah, that that's going to... Uh, I assume that that will uh, motivate a lot of um, vote out to the polls in the states where there is going to be a um, choice measure on the ballot. The other thing uh, that's going on with J.D. Vance is that uh, 
it seems that the Appalachia region, because in his book, Hillbilly Elegy, he writes about that part. That's where he grew up. Um, there's a lot of people who don't like what he said in that book from the region. A lot of people that don't like how he described people from that area. So um, he doesn't have many fans in the area that, uh, well, don't, don't say he doesn't, I can't say he doesn't have any fans. There's a vocal amount of non-fans of his in the region that uh, they're hoping to bring in. And um, that's kind of uh, interesting as well uh, because, you know, Appalachia, a lot of people think Kentucky and whatnot, but that stretches in uh, to certain parts of Pennsylvania, which is one of those swing states. Uh, J.D. Vance is uh, from Ohio, by the way. Um, so, yeah, um, that's about where it stands. Uh, oh, yes, the other thing uh, with J.D. Vance is that uh, the whole section of the Republican Party uh, that are really the purity testers are um, having a problem with him because his wife is not white. And he has mixed race children, one of which is named Vivek, which is kind of interesting um, to hear people talk like that if you happened to be a candidate for the Republican nomination and vice presidency, whose name was Vivek. Wouldn't it, Mr. Ramaswani? I'm just saying, all of a sudden, there are some people in the party that have problems with someone named Vivek. And he's a child. Are you sure you're with the right party, sir? Just ask him. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, how is he going to defend our white identity? How is he going to stop white replacement when dot, 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 I guess he's comm commingling his whiteness with dot, dot, dot. So, yeah. Not, uh, not the best, not the best. Um, the other little bit of news with regard uh, to J.D. Vance, and, and this one has a bit of a national collection, connection, is that it would appear that J.D. Vance is friendly, if you would say. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I can go so far as saying they are good friends, uh, but friendly with a recent member to the House of Commons, according to CBC. MP Jamil Giovanni and J.D. Vance bonded over being, quote-unquote, outsiders at a top U.S. law school. Quote, two men from disparate backgrounds who say they forged a friendship while feeling like outsiders at an elite American institution could help chart the future of the Canada-U.S. relationship. Those men are Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance, who was picked by former President Trump as his running mate on Monday, and Jamil Giovanni, the conservative MP who was elected to Parliament in a by-election early this year. If their respective parties win power this year and next, the long personal history between these two political neophytes could be an asset for Canada, some political watchers are saying. So you got some political watchers in Canada that turn around. Hey, it's great news that Trump picked a guy. who believes that women should stay in abusive relationships for the kids and that there should be no abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. Because he's school buddies with someone in Pierre Polyev's caucus. And should Pierre Polyev become prime minister? That'll make things great 
between both nations. Are you freaking kidding me right now? See, that's this thing in politics, what happens where everybody looks at every little detail in isolation in a vacuum. Yes. Yes, in isolation in a vacuum. That two people from two different countries, if they both happen to get in. And it seems that uh, Jamil, given how quickly he was uh, brought up from the news media into the politics and then having the full weight and support of the party thrown behind him and then gotten a seat right away and given high media profile right away. I think there's not any doubt that he's going to be a very, very key player in a polyf government should he reach government. So having those two know each other would be a benefit for Kenneth. Well, of course it would be. But who are the people? What do they stand for? What are their plans? Like broaden the scope. <laughs> uh, this sort of like, you know, you can zero in to the specificity a little too much. Just say, this is not. So, um, speculation, right? I said, I saw it on the chat here earlier. Um, you know, Trump, Trump had no, no choice because, you know, Vance is Putin's pick. Oh, yeah. Vance is also on record as saying he basically doesn't care what happens to Ukraine. So, you know, there we go. We say uh, Kit Rhiannon. Uh, J.D. Vance is Putin's choice. I don't think Trump had an option for who would be in his running mate. I'm going to guess that this is Kit Saucy via the Facebook feed here. Uh, chatting and adding that one here. Uh, but if that is indeed the case, um, then um, all of a sudden, uh, wanting to know what's in a Jamil Giovanni's past suddenly becomes a lot more interesting. So, uh, yeah, just, just notice the, 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 everything seems to be connected somehow here not sure what it means not sure if it means anything could have just been that they were two people who had harvard at the same time and who would have thought they would have been in politics at the same time but they are um the last little thing about everything uh going on in the u.s uh is uh with regard uh to uh the person who did die uh, who was in the crowd, who was a fire chief, who was protecting his family. Uh, it seems that his uh, spouse has gone on the record to say that President Joe Biden tried to call her and she declined to speak to him since her husband was, quote, a devout, devout Republican and he would not have wanted me to talk to him. Um, she did add, though, that she does not hold the current president responsible for what happened to her family. She said, quote, I don't have any ill, Ill will towards or don't have any ill toward Joe Biden. I'm not one of those people that gets involved in politics. I support Trump. That's who I'm voting for. But I don't have ill will towards Biden. He didn't do anything to my husband. A 20-year-old despicable kid did. Uh, but she did point out. Uh, that the family had not heard from Trump at all. Now, it seems that some, some people on his team did organize a GoFundMe at some point after it started circulating on social media that he hadn't called. Um, but from what I can tell, uh, there's been uh, um, the person who died's wife uh, has not gone back to the media to say whether or not. Uh, Trump has called since. Tells you a lot about a person, though. Because, um, oh yeah, I said that was the last thing, but there is one more thing. Because while Trump didn't have time for a phone call 
to uh, the wife of the person who died at his rally. Um, he sure did have time for a phone call with Raharf K. Jr. Didn't he? Didn't he? Oh, yeah. And uh, that one, if you're Canadian, particularly if you're Albertan, Shades of Kamikaze. Hmm? Conversation. Lots of talk about we won. Um, sounded like Trump was doing his Trump thing, you know, going over to someone and blowing a lot of sunshine up their butt about, you know, now entering into a, some type of deal with him, you know, will be uh, good for them and bring them only benefits and, like Mike Pence, do it. You'll go down in history. Everyone will love you. And if you don't do it, well, then you're a pussy. I believe he actually told him that specifically. Or something to that effect. Mike Pence could be so powerful. Could have so all he has to do is go down in history. He'll be remembered forever, celebrated. All that blown sunshine up your butt type thing. Oh, yeah, I totally believe in what you were saying about the vaccine stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 that's really... Bu- so, uh, but it seems that um, it was RFK Jr.'s son who leaked the tape, which is kind of interesting because um, it was a few months ago that the entire Kennedy clan got together and... Um, filmed an endorsement video claiming uh, that they were all for Biden. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, not sure what's going on there, but uh, I have a feeling that people will start digging into that a lot because there might be uh, a lot of media that might be a little scared uh, to going after Trump. Uh, who might be uh, less frightened to try to get at Trump through the RFK angle uh, if there was some type of agreement or deal uh, of some kind there for them to be working together. So uh, stay tuned to that. All right. Enough with the U.S. stuff. Oh, my God. What a freaking shit show. (laughs) I've seen. Jesus. Oh, man, 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 man. That is real. There's a lot going on. There's a lot. I don't, I don't know how media keeps up. I am having trouble keeping up. It's really something. All right. Oh, Kit Linda. That, I don't even know if I'm, I want to show that. I mean, yeah, I'm going to show it. Plot twist, Trump wins the election and then falls out of a White House window. I did. My take on that was watch your back, Donald, because I don't think JD intends is running to be your vice president thinking that you will get to end your term. That's one way to avoid the hang JD, hang JD. Like there was a hang Mike Pence. As if JD has some type of plan to make sure that Trump doesn't finish. But again, that was that would be if I was a political fiction writer. <laughs> Not sure my manuscript might get accepted either. <laughs> uh, nice compliment from uh, Kit Cassie saying that I'm doing a fine job flying solo producing again. Thanks so much. I am um, trying to learn the benefit of speaking a little more slowly than I usually do when I have Mr. Grizzly here, because sometimes I get excited and speak fast, especially if I'm reading from copy, and um, it gives me a a little more time to sort of navigate around. Um, I'm um, developing, I always appreciated the work that Mr. Grizzly did, but I'm developing a greater appreciation as I'm, uh, you know, trying to highlight 
chat comments, look over there. If you look over here, find my stories, find the different windows, find the images, put them up. It's um, you can't speak fast and do all of that at the same time and uh, <laughs> maintain coherence. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the compliment. Uh, it makes me uh, very happy to know that uh, you guys are enjoying the show. All right. Now, let's get back to Canada. Um, oh, gee, my, uh, I'm just noticing that uh, the chat um, kept going. Uh, I guess I must have been looking for something, uh, and uh, I got stuck where I was in the thread. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that uh, you guys have been saying uh, about the, the Trump and the shady thing here. Ooh, gee, all right. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you so much. Another beautiful compliment uh, from uh, Kit uh, Miss Shadika. I can listen to you talk all day. Ah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right, back home, back home. Uh, a few days ago, we reported to you, we started the news, uh, our show off with news you can use about uh, a product recall. Um, they were plant-based uh, beverages. Uh, most of them, I think, were um, the Great Value brand, and there was another brand. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll read to you what I have here uh, from the CBC, because uh, unfortunately, um, two people in Canada have died after getting sick with listeriosis, and the cases were connected to the nationwide recall of plant-based beverages. Uh, the two deaths happened in the province of Ontario, and they were confirmed by the Ontario Ministry of Health. Um, um, there's another infection in Nova Scotia, one in Quebec. Two-thirds of the cases are women, and more than half are over the age of 60. Uh, the connection between them is plant-based beverages like almond milk, oat milk, and coconut milk. Um, I think even cashew milk as well. Uh, specifically from the brands Silk and Great Value uh, with the best before date of October 4th, 2024 or earlier. Officials warn the listeriosis outbreak related to those products uh, are, are, are related to those products. Uh, listeria infection is less common than other food illnesses like E. coli, but and most patients who eat it eat contaminated food do get better by themselves after a few days of uh, unpleasant uh, fever diarrhea vomiting and headaches but for at risk groups like those with a weakened immune system or adults over the age of 60 the infection can spread to the bloodstream or to the brain where it can become fatal so officials are continuing to investigate the two deaths uh they're warning people to please um double check the size, the brands, and the best before dates. Um, so those are the notes that I have. Unfortunately, they do not uh, do not mention uh, the brand. So I'm just gonna look up here uh, on the the internet and um, try to get the brands for you, just to be sure here. Um, so again. According to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, um, they say that people became sick between August 2023 and early July 2024. Um, there are 12 listeriosis cases in all. Sorry, I have a little something in my throat. Um, 10 in Ontario and one each in Quebec and Nova Scotia, told, according to the federal agency's count. And this is... Uh, as of yesterday uh, at 9 p.m. on uh, CBC. Um, so here are the brands. Recalled certain silk and great value brands of oat, almond, and coconut refrigerated beverages over possible listeria monocytogenes contamination. The president of Danone, Canada, the manufacturer of the recalled drinks, said the company was working to investigate the circumstances surrounding the drinks. Quote, the news in this notice is devastating and our most sincere sympathies go out to the families and loved ones during this difficult time Frédéric Guichard wrote in a statement. Guichard noted that the company has conducted the recall and removed affected products from all retail shelves. The known had previously said the contaminated products were linked to a specific production line at a third-party manufacturer 
but authorities have not yet shared how the products were contaminated with listeria. Listeria monocytogenes is a type of bacteria that can cause listeriosis, a rare but serious illness with symptoms that may start suddenly and include vomiting, nausea, cramps, severe headache, constipation, or fever. More severe illness may result in the brain infection, meningitis, and blood infection in newborns and older adults. In recent years, about 134 cases of invasive listeriosis have been reported annually in the country, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada. Of these, Public Health Ontario reported 75 cases in 2023, including 14 deaths. So please uh, do check uh, for great value and silk beverages um, with a best before date of October 2024 or earlier. All right. And uh, if you have those, return them to the store or throw them away. Um, Kit Jim here says Listeria dies at 75 degrees Celsius. Cook your milk. Um, I personally don't know if that's, that's true myself, but uh, Kit Jim is pretty much a pretty good source for this type of stuff. So um, if he says it, I would tend to believe it. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Please, please do take good care of yourselves. Um, yes, we don't want uh, anybody to get sick from uh, eating food, or, and, and especially if you're trying to make healthier choices. Um, so, all right, that's what I got for that here. Um, big, big news in Ottawa, because history is being made today with Lieutenant General uh, Jenny Carignan being sworn in as Canada's first ever female Chief of Defence Staff. Um, she has long been considered a trailblazer for Canadian women serving in combat roles. And uh, she's had a 35-year uh, military career, has been deployed to Bosnia, Syria, and Afghanistan. She led NATO's training mission in Iraq, and was most recently in charge of transforming the military's culture after a sexual misconduct crisis. Um, not sure how far she got with that, uh, but she was tasked with it uh, for the time that she was in the position. Now she's taken over as the top soldier amid a serious shortfall in personnel and lack of readiness to respond to a crisis. Um, so yes, because there have been some uh, issues with the military uh, particularly with recruitment these days. And uh, as we mentioned um, earlier, uh, there was some uh, loosening of the uh, dress code and now a uh, slight adjustment of it uh, to try to sort of bring it back. Um, and, you know, and of course other measures, but uh, recruitment has, uh, has been trickier. Uh, according to an article of the, by the CBC, the ceremony will take place at the Canadian War Museum. She replaces General Wayne Eyre, who's retiring after 40 years in uniform. Um, Sandra Perron, Canada's first female infantry officer and a retired major, is quoted as saying, it's momentous because it's going to give young women a hope for their own dreams to come true. Carignan uh, is a combat engineer by profession. Uh, so that's... That, that's that, that's impressive. <laughs> uh, she commanded the NATO training mission in Iraq in 2020, led the task force Kandahar Engineer Regiment in Afghanistan from 2009 to 2010, and served in Bosnia in 2002, clearing explosive ordnance from farmers' fields. Um, yeah. Her appointment comes as Canada marks 35 years since women were first allowed to serve in most military occupations. So uh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, there was an interview with her on uh, Power and Politics uh, recently, uh, almost a 12-minute spot with David Cochran. So I haven't watched that yet, uh, but I'll definitely uh, check that out. And, uh, do recommend uh, that you do as well. And uh, because I have production credits, I can actually ah, put it right in the chat there for you, uh, kids and cubs. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, it's embedded about halfway through the article if you, you click on it, and then uh, you can watch that. But only after you watch the show. All right? Stay with us for now. <laughs> um, she, uh, Charlotte Duval-Lantoine, a fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute who studies military culture and personnel, is quoted as saying, 
The military is in a state of crisis today. Right now, we have aging equipment and lack of personnel. As we're bringing more and more equipment, the personnel recruitment and retention is not keeping pace. And when you add to that, uh, you know, our expanded role in NORAD uh, that we've announced uh, a while back, and then, of course, uh, trying to get to 2% of G GDP for NATO spending, uh, uh, defense spending to meet, to satisfy the requirements of NATO membership um, by 2032, and also having to hire all the staff to be able to get the money out the door fast enough, not just commit the money, but actually spend it. Um, the, you know, she will have uh, a lot of, uh, a lot on her plate in order to be able to take care of that. So, um, yeah. Uh, it, it is a, how do you put it? It's a difficult time. It's a challenging time, but it's a time where um, things are ripe for a few new traditions to be started. Right? Uh, and uh, maybe uh, she is the type of person that will be able to get that done. Um, the latest data shows the Canadian Armed Forces heard from more than 70,000 people interested in joining in 2023 2024. But the military was only able to get 4,301 of them into uniform due to a backlog in the screening process. While Carignan is inheriting all sorts of administrative and procurement problems, she's also in an enviable position, says Dave Perry, president and CEO of Canada Global Affairs Institute. Perry said Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is the first PM in this lifetime to promise to meet NATO's benchmark for alliance members' military spending, 2% of national GDP. After mounting criticism from NATO allies, Trudeau announced last week that Canada plans to hit that target by 2032, but offered few details. Uh, the leader of the opposition, uh, meanwhile, uh, even though he keeps on tis tisking at Canada for not meeting it, uh, has not committed himself. So, just so you know, he mentioned something about it to, at one point while he was posing and posturing, but it seems that getting a firm commitment that he would do it. Um, has has not been forthcoming yet. Um, quote, the government has earmarked hundreds of billions of dollars for reinvestment in our armed forces, and the vast bulk of that remains still to actually be spent, said Perry. So General Carignan is inheriting a very enviable situation, and I think most of her predecessors would have been extraordinarily jealous to have, uh, to have the great problem of how you spend a couple of hundred billion dollars on the Canadian armed forces. He said there's a massive opportunity here for Canadian armed forces to really reorient the future of the military. That's what I was saying. When I, that's what I meant when I was saying that she was arriving at a time where she could lay the groundwork for a, a lot of new stuff as well, because the moment seems to be right. Duval Antoine said it's important for the public to restrain its expectations of Carignan because those expectations can often be too high when it comes to women in powerful positions. Quote, we expect that because they know about the dysfunction of an organization and even have experienced misogyny and sexism in the organization, that they're going to fix the problem very quickly, she said. And that's putting too high of an expectation because one person cannot fix the problem that's the result of the behavior of 90,000 people and the structure of the organization that's very embedded. The blowback of General Carignan doesn't fix the readiness problem in the military could be much more intense than what we would see with a male chief of defense staff. Carignan went to study at the Royal Military College Saint-Jean in 1986, six years after it began admitting women. During her three years as the military's chief of professional conduct and culture, she traveled across the country holding town halls with military members as part of her efforts to address long-standing cultural issues. Governor General Mary Simon will preside over today's change of command ceremony. So there you go. Uh, that's happening today. And uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, this is really, really, really big news and I'm, uh, I'm happy. Um, I'm hoping that the, the appointment turns out well because unfortunately uh, our prime minister has not necessarily always had the best results or the best of luck. Um, you know, uh, the appointment of Jody Wilson-Raybould as being the first female justice minister um, didn't go as well as planned or hoped. Uh, the appointment of uh, Julie Payette as governor general did not go as well as hoped and or planned. Um, so, uh, you know, how would I put it? This is not in a proportion that's any more or less 
to appointment of men in certain positions that didn't work out. But for some reason, when it's a first and it's someone different, either visible minority or sexual minority or a woman, and something happens where it doesn't go well, the initial reaction is, oh, well, gee, we tried it. We sure can't do that again. Look how bad it turned out last time. And they make it about the gender or the race or the sexual orientation rather than the performance of the person who was just the wrong person for the fit uh, for that job. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, fisheries minister as well, yes. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully this will uh, this will this one will work out because uh, if there's one place that would really like it to work out, it's here. Hopefully, uh, she can bring along. Uh, the change that is needed. Uh, let's see, what else is do we have here for you, kids and cubs? Okay, well, you know what? Let's go to the first minister's meeting because yeah, I guess it was just a two-day meeting, so it officially ended. Uh, the first day uh, focused a bit on indigenous on indigenous indig indig ah, let's try that indigenous issues we had uh, Nathan Obed from the Inuit uh, Taparit Kanatami um that was there that uh, wasn't holding uh the highest of expectations for the meeting um but it seemed that the people that were in it uh were surprisingly pleased with how it went um I'm not going to complain about that um, because uh, provincial premiers, with potential the exception of BC, uh, and if we're talking about territorial premiers, of course they're in, um, not usually the most respect, re receptive. Usually not the most receptive. Uh, so it seems that... Um, the the people that were there felt um, that they got a good ear, if you would say, um, which is which is good, which is good, uh, and hopefully that keeps getting better and uh, these meetings keep on becoming more meaningful, because uh, one of those things uh, that keeps coming out of these meetings is all these people saying, you know, well. We're 400 nations. We're supposed to negotiate on a nation to nation basis, and we got like you come for your meeting and your provinces, and among you, you take two days, but like we get three hours in the afternoon for all our issues, for all our nations, for like really. So, you know, there's a feeling that a lot of these um, meetings are not. <sighs> meaningful or substantive um which is uh one of these things that happened with pierre polyev's uh, appearance at the afn um the other day which we touched about uh, touched on briefly uh yes yesterday but um when he was there um he went there he delivered his remarks he sat there for questions he got about four or five of them in about 10 minutes and Things are different in indigenous culture, right? So, you know, uh, you'll have someone at the mic saying, that, you know, please ask your questions quickly so that we can get as many as possible. But then someone will come to the mic and will, you know, introduce themselves. So, they, you know, they introduce themselves, they, 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 who they are, their nation, and talk about their people. If they have a spirit name, they'll present it. Sometimes they will say what they have to say in their indigenous language and then repeat it in English. So the questions are not don't come fast right when you go for a meeting an actual meeting meaningful you need to have the time you need to have the time uh so he went there he took about four or five questions and then apparently he just left he didn't stay to mingle talk afterwards uh, he didn't extend so he was only there for a certain amount of time in and out deliver his message and gone that doesn't work well jagmeet singh went to deliver his remarks and he was well, way, way more well received, got better applause, and people were more happy and had a lot more to say because he had arranged to stay after his session was over. 
and mingle and talk to people. You got, if you're just going there for your 40 minutes and your 40 minutes on the agenda, in and out, take a, well, it, it goes, that's not, that's not how, that's not how it works in that community. If you actually want to do business, and if you actually want to show that you're there for meaningful purposes. So, um, that the community felt that the meeting was productive is a very, very, very good thing, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, the meeting uh, was a little interesting because it kicked off with uh, Premier Tim Houston from Nova Scotia um, saying something about uh, the federal government needing to stay in their lane. Um, and then they kind of got all out of their lane. One of the things that they ended up recommending, and it seems that it was Premier Wab Canoe that was at the head of this, is that the federal government should increase its, uh, not increase its plan, uh, should hasten its plan to reach 2% of federal spending on national defense to satisfy NATO alliance members uh, in about four or five years from now rather than 2032. Um, that's kind of interesting uh, because it seems that military defense spending um, has nothing to do like at all with the lane in which provincial governments are. So when you start a meeting saying, you know, look, we we're kicking off the meeting and the theme of the meeting is federal government, stay in your lane. We're happy to partner with you and stuff, but like, just give us the money, don't impose conditions and go away. And then making a recommendation, federal government, you need to be changing your defense priorities and your whole budgetary priorities to get to 2% of GDP for NATO by 2029 rather than 2032 or 2028. Okay, um, this is an action for action's sake thing because this is something that's very easy for premiers to do because they have absolutely no responsibility for actually getting it done. And if it doesn't get done, they wear none of the blame because it's not their purview. And then the second thing that appears to have happened is that um, they went out on um, equalization. They seem to have a problem with equalization. And curiously enough, the big calls for changes with regard to equalization, um, how do I put it? are not coming from the usual suspects. They're coming primarily from the premier of Newfoundland and Labrador and the premier of British Columbia, which is really interesting. Um, according to iPolitics, depending on who you asked, the redistribution formula is either grossly unfair or a necessary policy to ensure critical services are provided equally in all corners of the country. So we're having two contrasting takes on equalization. Talk of equalization dominate, dominated the wrap-up press conference after BC Premier David Eby announced he was supporting a constitutional challenge of the program launched earlier this year by Newfoundland and Labrador. 
Quote, the Constitution is really clear, E.B. told reporters. It says this program is to ensure a minimum level of service for all Canadians. What we struggle to support is the idea that when British Columbians are struggling with affordability, struggling with the cost of living, to ask them to pay into a federal system that distributes money to another province that is not having challenges delivering basic services. B.C., Alberta, and Saskatchewan were the only provinces not projected to have receive any equalization payments in the current fiscal year, also known as have provinces. Meanwhile, Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Labrador, and PEI round out the have-not provinces, meaning they receive funding under the formula. It should be noted that have-not provinces receive varying amounts of funding. For example, Quebec is projected to receive $1,545 per capita in 2024-2025, while Ontario is expected to receive $38 per capita. So because Ontario happens to be on the have-not side of equalization formula at the moment, yes, at a full rate of $38 per person, David Eby is going, saying like this, we don't believe that people from British Columbia should be paying to support Ontarians, and so I'm going to join this constitutional challenge. Quote, <laughs> there we go, right here. We feel it's unreasonable for BC taxpayers to be sending money to the federal government to be redistributed to provinces like Ontario through the equalization program, said Eby. The system is clearly broken. So somewhere over the past few days, David Eby morphed from becoming an NDP leader in British Columbia to some love child of a UCP Alberta conservative and Pierre Polyev. The system is broken. It's unfair for us to be paying into equalization. Oh, my God, I can't believe the federal government is making us do this. Well, they're not. Uh, according to Canada.ca, Equalization Program. Canada, equalization program. Quote, equalization is financed by the government of Canada from general revenues, which are largely raised through federal taxes. Provincial governments make no contributions to the equalization program. Again, provinces, provincial governments make no contributions to the equalization program at all. So when David Eby is saying, we feel it's unreasonable for BC taxpayers to be sending money to the federal government to be redistributed to provinces like Ontario through the equalization program, he is either saying that The province is doing this, or are you saying that just Canadian taxpayers, just by paying taxes because a portion of it goes to equalization, and equalization goes somewhere else, might be spent in another province, that it's unconstitutional, it's the sign of a broken system. Again, we all pay. That pipeline to Tidewater, it's not running through Ontario. I paid for that. You don't see me complaining. I can't believe I paid for a pipeline for people in Alberta. It's like, and they paid for something over here that they don't get. That's what we do. It's like, <laughs> equalization is good for your people too in British Columbia, because, for example, should you be going to work in another province for a couple of years, like from people from Newfoundland, for example, who go work out west and then come back, and vice versa, people out west that go work on oil rigs in Newfoundland, yes, when they get to the, each other's provinces, they have a similar level of care and services. If they go there with their families for two years, the education is not worse. Kids don't fall behind. It's not like the provinces who claim that they're paying into equalization get nothing from the money that's spent in other provinces. Right? We say that there's no such thing as unskilled labor. All the people from Newfoundland and Labrador, the Maritimes, that go over to the West to help extract oil and everything else that has to do with oil and gas. The level of education that they have in their own province gave them the skills and the ability to be able to come here and do that, right? You got something for your money. It's not like it just goes somewhere and... Phew. 
So I'm not sure what he's going for here. But if he's basically saying that it is unconstitutional for the federal government to decide, hey, this portion of our revenues we are going to take and we're going to create a pot. And some is going to go to some provinces and some are not going to go to other provinces in certain years. Is unconstitutional. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know at all how you even have a case here. So, in my EV, so according to the article, EB vowed to intervene in Newfoundland's court case and also look at whether his provincial government should file a separate suit in BC. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe, who's never met a court case against the federal government that he wasn't happy to join, has also said his government will intervene in the case, while Alberta's Daniel Smith said she plans to watch the court proceedings, quote, with interest. God. <laughs> in budget 2018, the federal government committed to reviewing the equalization formula in 2024. According to EB, the Liberals reneged on that promise. Quote, this is not about a dispute with any premier across Canada. He said the federal government made an explicit decision not to sit down and renegotiate the formula with premiers. Okay. If that's true, that's not a cool, that's not a cool move. In a statement, Nafreet Chatwal, a spokesperson for Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland, said the program was reviewed earlier this year but did not immediately respond to iPolitics follow-up questions regarding details of the review. Quote, the federal government regularly speaks with provincial and territorial counterparts about equalization, read the statement, by law, another review must be completed by 2029. Equalization was also not without its provincial defenders, including Ontario Premier Doug Ford and Quebec Premier François Legault, both of whom argued that redistributing the funds still serves a purpose. Quote, I always believe in Canada as one country supporting each other, said Ford. We're a lot stronger when we work together. Of course, uh, we're talking about a guy that keeps on receiving funds. He doesn't care what source, what source he is and then misspending them or misallocating them. So, um, yeah, um, even though he is saying the right things, he's not the guy to be the messenger for this. <laughs> just say. It just sounds wrong coming out of his mouth, knowing what he does with the money. Um, for his part, Legault said he's not proud that Quebec has been historically reliant on payments from other provinces, but that his province needs this money to be able to offer equivalent services. Quote, the principles around equalization payments are that we want in Canada to be able to offer equivalent services in each province, said Legault. My target since I'm premier is to get rid of equalization payments. I really hope in the future Quebec pays some equalization. Again, nobody pays. <laughs> you just have or have not. You receive or you don't receive. It's not pay into and not pay into. It's just, I am so tired of them claiming that they pay. They don't pay. They receive or they don't. That's it. According to the federal government, every province has received equalization payments at some point since the program was first implemented in 1957. Another theme of this year's meeting was defense spending, as premiers called on the federal government to meet its target of spending 2% of the national GDP on military. The issue was first raised by Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe, who expressed concerns that failing to meet that target in the coming years will have a negative impact on Canada's trading relationship with the U.S. Quote, if we think through what's going to happen in the next few years with the U.S. election and a new administration potentially, we have to get to the 2% NATO spending target for defense, said Canoe. I want Canadians to see this as a national security thing and an investment in the Canadian armed forces, but I encourage Canadians to also look at this as an investment in trade. If we're not meeting our responsibilities to our NATO allies, it is going to have an impact on the Canada-U.S. states-Mexico agreement renewal. It's going to have an impact on that relationship. Canoe added that it's imperative for Canada to meet that target within the next four years. Last year, Canada only spent 1.29% of its GDP on defense, and a policy update released by the Liberals earliest year provided no timeline for reaching 2%, although since then, the Prime Minister has pre presented uh, information uh, at NATO saying that we would achieve it by 2032. Um, uh, we had only committed to spend 1.76 by 2030. Uh, at that point. 
Canoe's uh, comments were echoed by several of his provincial colleagues, including Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston, the meeting's chair, who said meeting the target was necessary for the U.S. to respect Canada. Quote, in terms of the NATO obligations and the 2%, a lot of focus is on defense, but I think it's broader in its relationship with the U.S. Meeting our obligations is just the right thing to do. Ontario is set to host next year's meeting of the premiers, with Ford taking on the role of chair. When asked about his priorities for next year's discussion, Ford said expediting approval times for life-saving medications, increasing federal infrastructure funding, and supporting the critical minerals industry. So, we have the premiers who, while telling the federal government to stay in their lane, giving them advice on defense spending, and um, telling them, um, taking them to court, essentially, and telling them that they're going to put a whole bunch of legal actions uh, on the program, on the equalization program, which is a strictly federal program, which is strictly within the federal government's purview. Yeah. I'm, um, yes, Kit uh, Cassie. Is this posturing by BC premiers as he has an election coming as trying to keep ahead of the two conservative parties that are uniting? Well, I am glad that you mentioned that, Kit Cassie. Thank you very much, because that is something I was wondering too. Because, um, hmm, I'm not sure if I can make this big enough, but yeah, it seems that I can. Um, if we look at 338. Canada.com, all of a sudden, um, we see here that in, what's this, this is in October 2023, uh, the BC, BCC party and the NDP party were very far apart, but then that Unite the Right movement sort of happened, and you could see that they spiked up, retreated a little bit, and spiked up again that there's only 4% difference in popular vote production projection. So in October, it looked like the NDP was just whistling its way to another majority this October. And then all of a sudden, as the election gets near, look what happens. And that's why I keep on saying, don't worry about the PP and the Trudeau numbers just yet. Because there's always a gap before, and as an election becomes more of a reality, there's a revert to the mean a little bit, and then things happen. But it's getting a little tighter than uh, they would like. Uh, that's in terms of popular vote projection, in terms of seat production projection. Still a healthy lead, about a 15-seat lead, and uh, still a majority territory for the NDP. Uh, but uh, the NDP is coming in now at 53 seats when uh, just uh, past January 1st, let's say mid-January, uh, they were projected to get about 80 seats. 80 versus 53. So yeah, uh, that might have something to do with it uh, because uh, running against Ottawa is always uh, a popular option. Um, when speaking about running against Ottawa, uh, it seems that uh, Doug Ford once again is playing coy with whether or not he's going to be calling a snap election. Um, but uh, in it, uh, when talking about it, uh, he too is talking about running against Ottawa. And uh, when it comes to that, Kits and Cubs, um, how do I put it? When Ottawa is doing something that really shouldn't be done, I can understand running against Ottawa. Uh, but when... How to put it? When you're going to do what Doug Ford is considering doing at the moment, which is basically quitting his job early in order to secure another mandate before the next federal election, because uh, if Doug thinks that Pierre is going to win the next federal election, and in Ontario, if we have a federal conservative government, then we usually get ourselves a liberal provincial government and vice versa. Uh, that means that if his election comes after the federal election and Pierre wins, 
his odds of losing the next election increase dramatically, or so he believes. So he would like to fit one in before. But he already has the majority. So uh, why does he need to go? He would only need to go if he had some type of societal project that was so transformational. That was one of those things that was saying, well, if you're going to do that, that's something you should really take to the people. Well, according to the Toronto Star, it's Kristen Rush, Rushawi, Doug Ford tells the Star he won't rule out an early election and vows to defend Ontario like a pit bull against Ottawa. From what? Defend like a pit bull against what? Your best friend, Christian Freeland? Your the fact that there's someone there that's not like Poliev, who you can't stand anyway. Like, I, I don't understand this push from him. But once again, if you're the a politician and you want to go to an early election when you already have a majority and the only thing in your platform really is to run like a pit bull against Ottawa, to defend Ontario like a pit bull against Ottawa. Um, that's when you say when you have no plans, no policy, and no priorities for the people you claim to serve. That's a sign that a government is tired. Doug Ford's government is tired. It only wants power for the sake of power so that it can keep on accessing the public purse and the public good and hiving it off and selling it to his buddies. But it has absolutely no plans for actual people. So, um, yeah, I am uh, not impressed with this at all. Not impressed with this at all. Uh, yeah, not great. Not great at all. Uh, and um, uh, there's, um, when it comes to him, uh, there's a, how would I put it? You just look at all the events together. You got the green belt. And then there was the Service Ontario things. And then the Therm Spa. And then the Ontario Science Centre, which there's a plot twist on this because Olivia Chow has come up and said that uh, the specific lease says that there can't be anything on the site of the Ontario Science Centre other than an Ontario Science Centre. Uh, so uh, if she wants to make Doug Ford's uh, life a little uh, difficult with uh, breaking, the, breaking the lease, uh, that's something that might uh, be able to happen there. Um, but you add them all together, and then the LCBO thing right now. Yes, and uh, uh, public sentiment is not on the premier side on that one. I think it's about 54% of Ontarians are supporting uh, the LCBO strikers. Um, when you add that all together, that's a lot of money coming out of the public purse, being diverted to other places. Well, like, and we're hearing more of them. There's another deal in, in Ottawa or something like that that was uh, um, some land that was sold for $1 so that uh, a medical facility or something of some kind could be expanded and there's a for-profit senior's home uh, going on that land from a company um, that has been brought to court for having provided very, very, very poor service to the residents in its care. Uh, there's just too much, man. <laughs> there's, there's just too damn much. Um, 
So when you have that much going on and you don't seem to have a plan other than uh, what public good can I liquidate today, I'm not sure with what you go to the public and say, elect me again. Not sure. It seems a little weird to me. But yeah, we'll see uh, what's going on. Um, in the UK, uh, they had the speech from the throne for Keir Starmer's new government. Uh, they, um, it's really interesting because the, they don't call it the speech from the throne there. I uh, can't remember what, I wrote the name down somewhere and I can't remember where it is. Uh, but he opened, uh, delivered the speech at Westminster to formally open Parliament's labor priorities, building more homes, creating a new publicly owned energy company to drive green power, as well as a new border command to stem the flow of asylum seekers crossing the English Channel from France in small, sometimes dangerous boats. Um, so yeah, just a, a little ad, uh, note about that. And in France as well, uh, it would seem that uh, there are negotiations going on uh, to be able to form the new government. Uh, the, pre pre the, prime, the Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal, uh, and uh, everyone have officially resigned, uh, but they are staying there in place uh, until such time as the, the right, uh, not the right, the left, sorry, can get together to nominate someone to take the role. Uh, so far, they've not been able to agree on someone, but it seems that uh, talks are going well on that front. But when it's coming to overall policy, it seems that the more militant left faction uh, is not willing to make concessions on certain things, and it's uh, preventing the group from uh, coming together and deciding, uh, I guess, on uh, who they want as president and on a uh, set of legislative priorities. So that might take a little while yet uh, to happen. Uh, but it seems that the negotiations are underway and they are progressing. Uh, and uh, as the, uh, that the structures are there to make sure that the government is still running while those decisions are being made. Uh, since we're speaking of France, uh, the mayor of Paris, uh, apparently, uh, took a swim in the Seine yesterday uh, to prove that it was okay to swim in uh, for the open water swim and triathlon events uh, from for the Olympics, uh, Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. So um, uh, I wasn't convinced that it would be ready. Uh, Devin Aru wasn't convinced that it would be ready because uh, when uh, Mr. Grizzly asked the question, we were both right away going, nope, nope, it won't be ready. Uh, but it seems that some people jumped in it and went for a swim. Uh, there's one person uh, that was there and said, I always wanted to swim in it all my life, and I probably will now, but I'll probably take a very, very, very long shower after. Um, how clean is clean? We don't know. Uh, hopefully, uh, we won't find out uh, that, like, you know, a couple of days from now that the mayor is very, very ill or any of the other people who jumped in. Uh, but apparently, there are some people who are willing to jump in believe it's safe enough to do so so um yeah we'll <laughs> we'll see what's going on there um but those are some uh the bigger things in those ones because we're you know we're wondering what's going to happen with the fallout uh from the elections there and how they're going to organize so it seems that uh, that's happening um uh, in that front uh in germany uh for some reason uh it seems that they are looking at uh, changing the amount of money uh, they want to spend with regard to Ukraine in the future. Uh, it seems that they are going to be cutting it by about half. I remember, uh, if I remember reading the article, uh, remember the article I read correctly. Uh, but they say that the reason for this is not so much because they don't it's not because they don't support of it and don't believe in it anymore, but because with uh, the $50 billion uh, loan they were able to give Ukraine by um, borrowing against the increased value of Russian assets that they seized, as now they have some money front-loaded 
uh, and they won't need to, to be able, they won't need to do that uh, as much in future years. Also, probably politically, given the trashing that the governing party, the Social Democrats, took in the European parliamentary elections, um, PR-wise, uh, saying that you're going to be cutting support to Ukraine in half uh, is something they probably think will be playing well in the country, given the current moment, uh, even though there is money being given up front. So uh, I guess they're uh, maybe cleverly taking advantage of a change in structure um, with regards to financing that which is going on in Ukraine in order to uh, solve a domestic issue as well. So we'll see how that uh, that works for them on the, on that front. Um, let's see, what do we have here today? Um, with um, the Prime Minister, uh, there was a call, if you remember correctly, uh, for him to have a meeting with his entire caucus sometime before September. And there was somebody from the party, her name was Brenda Shanahan, but I can't remember what her specific role was in, in the party, who uh, stated that uh, that was not going to happen uh, logistically. Uh, it, it just could not happen. Uh, but it would seem that uh, there will be some time made specifically for uh, a meeting, probably just about 20 minutes. I have a feeling that it might last longer um, once people actually get in the room. Uh, but uh, a huddle, a virtual mini huddle with this French bench team uh, is going to be happening, uh, according to uh, Canadian press, I think it is, who's reporting that. Uh, it'll be the first time that the cabinet ministers have come together since the Liberals' loss in the, the Toronto by-election at Toronto St. Paul's, and would take place amid a new wave of speculation on a possible shuffle. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is set to attend a mid-morning change of command ceremony for the incoming Chief of Staff, Jenny Carignan, at 9.25 a.m., by the way, so that'll be starting in just a few minutes at the Canadian War Museum. Um, so, yeah, uh, interesting to see uh, what's going on there. Um, but yes, there is some speculation uh, about a shuffle, which um, I'm just trying to find the, the CP, the Canadian Press article about that for you, so I can read a little bit more uh, to you. Uh, let's see if I got this. This is not Canadian. Yeah, Canadian Press. There we go. Um, just a brief thing. The Prime Minister's office says the Liberal Cabinet will have a brief meeting this Friday. A separate source with knowledge of the meeting who wasn't authorized to speak publicly said it was scheduled to be about 20 minutes long. Cabinet has to approve sub-governor and council appointments before they can be announced. The brief meeting will mark the first time the Cabinet Ministers have come together since Liberals' devastating loss in a Toronto by-election last month. Since then, uh, yeah, whatever... Uh, it's not unusual for cabinet to meet less frequently during the summer as MPs fan out to hit the countrywide barbecue circuit. Uh, that seems to be the, about the only thing that I can see in that version of it. Uh, let's see if that was an edited version. No, it wasn't. That seems to be the extent of it. So yes, uh, so possibly a cabinet shuffle coming along. Um, yes, <laughs> get saucy. I like that one. Trudeau will make a cabinet shuffle and then Polyev will say that this proves Trudeau's policies are no good and the rest of the BSC spews. <laughs> uh, uh, Kit Linda, uh, with regard to the story in this, uh, about the swimming in the Seine, I read that swimming in the Seine has been prohibited for over a hundred years. I think you are correct about that, Kit Linda M., if I am not mistaken. Uh, Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo took a dip in the murky waters on Wednesday. She was accompanied by members of her cabinet as well as officials from the Olympic Organizing Committee. The cleanup project began in the 1990s under former French President Jacques Chirac, then mayor of Paris, who had always promised to swim in the river. However, it stalled for 30 years. Speaking to reporters after her swim, still dripping in her bathing suit, Hidalgo said she was thinking of Chirac today because he was never able to take that swim Quote, and now we are doing it thanks to the Olympic Games. Uh, let's see what it was. When the Olympic organizers announced they would 
pulled the triathlon and long distance swimming events in the Seine. The cleaning efforts catapulted to top of government priority list. Over the course of nine years, the French government invested over 1.5 billion into various projects. The most recent constructing several 13 million gallon holding tanks to take overspill from the city's antiquated sewer system during heavy rains and prevent the sewage from flooding into the Seine. Um, the, her swim was originally scheduled for June, but heavy rains all spring and summer sent the river's equali rates soaring, pushing the date back and threatening the cancellation of athletic events. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here that says... No, it does not say if it was uh, prohibited for 100 years. So uh, unfortunately, I can't confirm that. Um, I thought it would be included in this article, but it is not. Um, so yeah, there you go with regard to that trying to see if there's anything else I missed here. So just give me a couple of seconds, kits and cups. Oh, yeah. There is this as well. Yes, this I should uh, definitely talk about. Um, oh, yeah. About uh, the, the Germany cutting military aid. Um, to uh, Ukraine, um, the, the, the numbers that I have here uh, is that uh, it says here, although military aid to Ukraine will be cut, Germany will comply with the NATO, NATO target spending 2% of GDP on defense in 2025 with a total of 75.3 billion euros. Days after Russia's 22 invasion of Ukraine, Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced uh, Zeltenwende German for a historic turning point with a 100 billion euro special fund to bring the military up to speed. From the special fund, there will be 22 billion euros more for defense plus 53.3 billion euros in the regular budget, still less than sought by Defense Minister Boris Pistorius. The defense budget is set to receive a meager 1.3 billion euros more in 2024, far below the 6.7 billion requested by the defense minister. Um, in uh, the budget of 2025 in uh, Germany comes with the midterm financial planning until 2028, the year when the Armed Forces Special Fund to meet NATO's minimum spending goals is due to run out, and $80 billion will be needed for defense as noted in the financial plan. In 2028, there's a gap of €39 billion Euros in the regular budget, of which €28 billion Euros are needed to comply with the NATO target without the special fund, sources from the finance ministry said. Um, so, yeah, it says... Uh, who is it? Ingo Gadechens, who's a member of the Parliamentary Budget Committee from the Conservative Opposition Party, says the 80 billion euros that have been put on display for 2028 simply do not exist. The coalition is not even trying to cover this up, but are openly admitting it. Um, so yeah, little controversy there as to uh, whether or not uh, Germany is, uh, is backing out or not there. Uh, but the conservatives within the country seem to be uh, a little concerned about that. Um, so that's what we have for here. Uh, in uh, Canada, um, there was an announcement uh, of uh, money for public transit uh, that was put out. And uh, Sean Fraser has a great video about it. Uh, I am not sure uh, that I'm able to play it because I've been having trouble with the audio. But I'm going to try and experiment here, Kits. Uh, and please let me know if you hear it because I suspect that it might be a microphone setting uh, that I need to change in order to be able to play sound and not just show an image. So um, I'm going to try it. L please let me know if you hear it. And uh, if that works, then uh, that's great. Uh, I'll be able to show it to you. And if it's not, then I'll just uh, cut um, uh, the video. Or I'll play it without sound because it does have subtitles. Uh, and I can uh, read it out loud for the people who are listening at home. So uh, just give me an opportunity here. and. Let's see if I can make this happen from my end. 
Okay, so Sean Fraser put out a tweet that said, people don't want politicians to pick fights with one another. They want us to work together to solve problems. We're at the table and want to work with the provinces to help solve some of the biggest challenges facing the nation so we can help make Canada the very best country it can be. All right, and then he has a video. So hopefully I will bring it to the beginning. And Kits and Cubs, uh, you can let me know if you do hear it. I've changed the head, uh, microphone setting. Uh, please let me know. So, Sean Fraser. Okay, I am told that the, the kits cannot hear it. There's no sound. Okay, so uh, what I will do, um, unfortunately, it, it is not Sean Fraser's voice, uh, but I will play it and uh, read it out loud for the people who are listening at home. Uh, I'm sorry, I still do not know why it is. Uh, I cannot uh, broadcast sound from where I stand. Uh, so I, I apologize profusely. Uh, but Sean Fraser says, Canada, pre Canada premiers here are guard. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn down the volume actually from my end because I can hear him and I can't speak while he's speaking. There you go. Canada's premiers are gathered here in my home province of Nova Scotia to discuss some pretty big issues that are important to people in every part of the country issues like healthcare, housing, and education. Now, the headlines covering our meetings over the last couple of days have suggested they largely want the federal government to butt out of their affairs and stay in its own lane. Now, it's pretty common for politicians to pick fights with one another when it comes to an electoral advantage. They may see and having that fight. But I can tell you that I talk to people from across Canada at home and they're sick and tired of politicians fighting with one another. They want us to work together to actually solve these big problems. I don't think it's controversial that when we put tens of billions of new dollars on the table for spending in health, we insist that it's invested in things like more doctors for families who don't have them. I don't think it's controversial that when we invest record amounts of funding from the federal government in housing, which may be a provincial responsibility, we expect provinces to do things to make it easier to build homes. And I don't think it's controversial when we launch a national school food program, we'll have willing partners with the provincial governments to actually make sure that kids aren't hungry when they're trying to learn every day at school. Now, I know that picking fights isn't going to solve problems. So my message to the premiers is that we're at the table. We want to help. And we hope that we can work together to solve these big problems for people who don't live their lives in fear of federal provincial jurisdiction, but want the country to be the very best it can be. Boom. And it sounds much better coming from him. <laughs> because he has that accent and that way of delivering the lines uh, that, are, uh, th that are unique to him and that make him so, uh, so compelling. As a figure, um, so yes, I'm. A, I'm sorry, I did not have the volume uh, to be able to do that. But yeah, I uh, wanted to put that out there because uh, that's very important. And as part of that deal, uh, the federal government has announced uh, details of a thirty billion dollar investment over ten years for public transit, according to iPolitics. Applications open Wednesday for two streams in the federal government's new $30 billion public transit fund, even though the money won't start flowing for another two years, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said. The 10-year Canada public transit fund has been in the works for months and was in the recent federal budget, but more details were provided as Trudeau made a visit to a subway yard in Toronto. Quote, we're stepping up with the kind of predictable long-term transit funding that means our partners like the City of Toronto and Mayor Olivia Chow can plan for not just the next couple of years, but for the next decade and beyond, Trudeau said. The money will be divided into three categories, baseline funding for existing systems, metro region agreements for Canada's biggest cities, and funding for specific things like rural communities, indigenous communities, and active transportation. The Liberals say this will complement the housing accelerator fund by tying housing money to projects that are near public transit. That plan includes eliminating mandatory minimum parking requirements for new construction and allowing high-density housing projects near transit. The money isn't set to flow for another... That's... No, okay, there's an error in the article here. Uh, the money isn't set to flow until 2026, but applications opened for the baseline funding and the metro agreements to allow cities to start planning. 
Housing Minister Sean Fraser in an interview Wednesday said it's important for public infrastructure like transit to be built in a way that will be resilient to the impacts of severe weather events. Major roadways in Toronto, where Trudeau met with Chow, were subject of flash flood on Tuesday, with parts of the city seeing a month's worth of rain in a single day, beating the previous record set in 1941. While some drivers were focused to abandon their vehicles on flooded streets, transit systems too saw surges of water. Quote, if you think something is expensive to build the right way, try building it twice, Fraser said. Quote, we need to work very closely with municipal officials, with provincial officials, and make available the best information we have to ensure the systems that we invest money into are built in a way that will deliver the greatest return on that investment over time. And that includes consideration of the impact of severe weather events on the infrastructure that we built today. So uh, that is uh, another good move from the federal government. Um, again, uh, plans that are intended to start after the next uh, federal election, um, even though people can start apply now in terms of money flowing, um, which means that uh, that uh, fund will probably be a big part of the election campaign. Um, the other bit of news that came out that you're probably quite familiar with now, particularly if you live in Saskatchewan, and we did touch upon it a little bit yesterday, was the whole thing having to do with um, uh, Saskatchewan, the government of Saskatchewan deciding that it was not going to remit back to the federal government. Uh, funds that uh, it said it was not collecting on carbon pricing uh, but it's that it still owes to the federal government because the products were sold right and they're turning around and saying well you know no no we don't we don't owe that we don't owe that at all and uh, you know we're not we're not collecting it so we don't have to remit it uh, well just because you collect it you or you refuse to collect it doesn't mean that you know the charges still don't apply and that you don't have to remit the money so it's this kind of weird thing you know the turnaround like if we pretend that the law doesn't exist and we don't collect the money then we don't have to remit the money to you um, no it doesn't work that way it's like you know when you have phone service you, know, you pretend that your phone bill uh, doesn't kind of hasn't come in and you decide that you don't have to pay the phone bill um, usually what happens is that your phone gets cut off. Right? And then uh, what else that happens is that, uh, well, not only does your phone get cut off, but uh, people then try to collect the money. So um, it seems that uh, the federal government had started to pursue the government of Saskatchewan uh, for some of that money. Uh, it seems that the government uh, it owes about $56 million and that the government was trying to claim uh, $28 billion of that and was planning to do it uh, by garnishing wages, which is, again, typical. Uh, you know, if you are a Canadian citizen and you owe taxes to the CRA and at some point uh, your wages are going to be garnished that just happens um, so they were going to now of course the government of Saskatchewan uh, because you know it's right wing and mo and pro convoy and whatnot tried to link that to the convoy and was making the statement that uh, the government was trying to freeze or seize its bank account um, no they were just trying to get what belonged to them. Uh, now, it seems that within the context of that, um, there was an agreement that was reached between both sides. And for some reason, again, I cannot find <laughs> the, the article uh, with, re with regard to it. Uh, but this was it was spun two very different ways depending if you were the federal government and that was uh, minister marie claire bibot 
or whether or not you were the government of Saskatchewan. And um, yeah, not uh, the government of Saskatchewan doesn't come out looking really good in this one. Uh, if you're looking at the competing um, takes on it. Now, it would seem that when it was all done, uh, Bronwyn Eyre, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, who was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General uh, for the government of Saskatchewan, put out a statement saying, we stopped them. The government of Saskatchewan has been successful in preventing the federal government from its unconstitutional attempt to grab money out of Saskatchewan's bank account. Only the province can access Saskatchewan's consolidated revenue fund. There can be no garnishment by the federal government. The province's bank account and general revenue fund are safe and sound, and all monies remain there thanks to the court's early intervention. On June 26, Saskatchewan reached out to the CRA with alternatives to garnishing the consolidated revenue fund of the province. The CRA ignored those outreaches and instead decided to garnish she the province's fund contrary to Section 25 of the Constitution. Or Section, sorry, not Section 25. Uh, I misread that. Sorry, it's a little blurry here. Section 126 of the Constitution. We have now come to the very type of arrangement that could have been contemplated back in June. Saskatchewan has offered to establish a letter of credit, which is common practice for companies and other large entities in explicitly provides for provided for under the federal carbon tax legislation it will remain in place until our dispute is determined by the tax court of canada our arguments going forward remains the same fair application of the law minimum national standards and no regional favoritism that means the saskatchewan government will continue to provide the same carbon tax exemption on home heating that the trudeau ndp government is given other parts of canada that's a lie and that exemption will remain in place until this federal government or the next one does the right thing and gets rid of the carbon tax on everyone and everything. And the reason I say it's a lie is because if the Saskatchewan government was providing the same carbon tax exemption on home heating that the Trudeau NDP government is given to other parts of Canada, their exemption would be on households in Saskatchewan that are using home heating fuel. And then they would probably be given them a big subsidy to help them convert to a heat pump. That's not what the government of Saskatchewan is doing. The government of Saskatchewan has stopped choosing, stopped charging carbon pricing on all forms of heating. Not just on home heating oil. So they are not doing the same thing. That's a lie. And now, the claims of them reaching out to Revenue Canada with all these other forms of... Right? Is that true? Well, it's what they say. They say a lot of things. The statement from uh, the Honorable Marie-Claire Bibot, the Minister of National Revenue, quote, the Canada Revenue Agency and the province of Saskatchewan have reached an agreement. This agreement represents a victory for the rule of law. They're both claiming it as a victory. But the government of Saskatchewan is claiming it as a victory for the government of Saskatchewan and the people of Saskatchewan against big, bad Ottawa. Whereas the federal government is claiming it as a victory for the rule of law. Notice the difference in tones. This agreement represents a victory for the rule of law. As a result of the agreement, the CRA has secured 50% of the outstanding funds owed by Saskatchewan for their portion of the price on pollution until the full resolution of the dispute. So yeah, that carbon fee, if you live in Saskatchewan, that you've been told that you've not been paying, you've just paid it. It wasn't charged directly to your bill. But it is going to come out of provincial coffers, and that's your tax dollars. So you're paying it. Scott Moe is creating the illusion that you're not paying it. In order to score some extra points, because he too has got an election coming up, and uh, things have tightened up between his party and the NDP as well. But you're still paying it. It's still owed, and the CRA is taking steps to get its money. It's literally pulling Ariana. 
Mo better have my money. They signed an agreement that allowed the CRA to secure 50% of the outstanding funds owned, owed by Saskatchewan. The government of Saskatchewan, this is again from the statement, the government of Saskatchewan has also committed to securing future outstanding amounts in the same agreed upon manner. While an outstanding amount remains to be paid, this agreement ensures that Saskatchewan complies with the law on the funds they owe the CRA. We are pleased that Saskatchewan has agreed to operate within the law, which is the obligation for all registered distributors, including the province of Saskatchewan. As the Minister of National Revenue, let me be clear. We are committed to upholding this legislation. This is legislation that the Supreme Court upheld as constitutional. This is legislation that propels us towards a more sustainable future. We pledge to be fair to all Canadians by providing the full Canada carbon rebate where the federal backstop system applies, returning more money to the pockets of 8 out of 10 families. We will not let political games others may play get in the way of addressing the climate crisis while making life more affordable for Canadians. Now here, the federal government has strategically done a really smart thing because by not taking away the refunds, they haven't made it impact the people directly. And the people directly who think they're not paying the carbon tax have just found out that they are and will be. And any type of legal fight that comes, additional spending, like this, that the government says casual will be saved because we're fighting for you, is nothing but PR expenses. It's publicity, it's marketing. Using the law as a marketing tool. But... Uh, as soon as it was about to go to court, look how quickly the government of Saskatchewan was willing to make a, a deal and to start paying. They know they're on the losing side of this. This is the federal government calling their bluff. And Saskatchewan blinked. They blinked rather hard here. But notice the two different tones. Notice the two different tones. Only one of them is behaving like an adult. Only one of the parties is grown up here. Ah, oh, boy. Kids and cubs. I think, you know what, that's going to be the end for today because uh, I went on a whole lot longer than I thought I would. But uh, there was a lot going on. I mean, just the UF stuff took about an hour on its own. So, um, all right, kids and cubs, I think I'm going to call it a show. <laughs> That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us, to me, I guess in this case, because I like making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So uh, please be kind. Well, yes, do be kind too and gentle with yourself, but please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Kind of a got to the end a little too quickly there. <laughs> if you would like to support us, you can, thanks to the Ray Girl who sponsored our pod page. I don't have the QR code for you today. But if you go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, ah, that would make me very happy if you click subscribe. And it will make you very happy because whenever we have an episode, it comes fresh off the bandwidth and goes directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, please make like Kit Elaine, who, again, very, very wonderful uh, with the compliments. Thank you. You did a wonderful job, dear queen. I am. Um, I live to serve my loyal subjects. <laughs> and therefore, I appreciate it. Ah, uh, miss, thank you, Douglas. My soul has come today because of you. Thank you. What a beautiful thing to say. Thank you. Oh, my God, you guys are so wonderful to me. I love you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kit Elaine's here and says, smash some buttons, everyone. I like that. Smash some buttons. Like, share, subscribe. They're all waiting for you. Uh, we just crossed 4,400 on our uh, YouTube uh, subscribers. So uh, thanks to all of you who are joining. Uh, hopefully you're all listening on your own time if you're not uh, joining us live, uh, but are enjoying the product. So um, really appreciate the time that you do that, uh, then that you give to us that way. If uh, you would like to support us in other ways, sorry, I I'm really have something stuck in my throat today. You can do that thanks to our coffee page. That's ko-fi.com slash eager beaver. And you can do as uh, some kits have recently done. 
And uh, since we're here today, let's see if I, we can do a little uh, appreciation. Uh, first of all, thank you to Kit Cassie uh, once again for quite a uh, generous donation. Um, very grateful. Um, I, I, I really don't know what to say anymore. You, you're just so, 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 so good to us. But uh, to keep you hydrated, to deliver fact-based political news coverage, keep going and growing, lads, uh, is what she said. And then we had Kit Vim, who sent us a little something. And I believe something through Super Chat as well uh, a couple of days ago. So thank you for that. Um, but also through our coffee, uh, who says, These podcasts are the best way to start my day. I love the damn fam and the subject matter, always relevant. Thanks from the bottom of my heart. I wish you a very smooth and restful day. That was about a week ago. And then uh, Kit Wendy, who has sent us something. Cheers, guys. Thanks for your great work. Always appreciate starting my day with you and the damn fam. Best. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's see if there are a few others back there that I may have forgotten to mention. Um, I think I mentioned Kit Suzanne, but in case I hadn't, I will again. Uh, Kit Suzanne, thank you for honest, thoughtful, and real news offerings for your humane and down-to-earth approach that makes us feel like friends and for creating an inclusive and supportive community. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, you guys are the best. Um, your support does mean the world to us. Uh, and of course, uh, as we call, you know, Mr. Grizzly made clear the other day, we do call it uh, the emergency hydration fund, but really uh, we put it into the show and try to bring stuff uh, to you. It, it, it's, it, it's a little tiny bit, the emergency hydration fund when we have a pub day, but uh, podcast day. But other than that, uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're here for the news. We're here for the news, bits and cups. Um, so uh, thank you for the appreciation and the love and the feedback. We really uh, love it. And we love hearing from you. So uh, True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is our email address. True Eager is our Twitter feed. You have our YouTube page, the comments section. You can leave something there or on our Facebook page where you might be today if you're watching live. Uh, please leave your comments there. We try, do try to read everything. If you've got suggestions, stories, all of that. Uh, sometimes we're not always able to answer, uh, but we do read it and we do take it in. So thank you so, so very much. We appreciate all the help that you give us in terms of putting the show together. And there are many things in today's show that came from you, uh, clips and uh, screen caps and stuff like that, that I was able to integrate. So uh, thank you so very much. Really appreciate it. It makes my job a little easier, particularly when I'm short on time uh, to prepare a show for you that uh, you just uh, hand deliver me. Here, here's what you need. And it's right there. And it's like, thank you. <laughs> I don't I don't have to look for it. <laughs> um, so that's uh, always a, a wonderful thing. Um, but please, yes, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. If you would like to make a contribution there, we really do uh, appreciate everything that you do for us there. Uh, let's see, because democracy is something that you do. Um, please, 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 if you can, um, write to the Minister of Veterans Affairs, Jeanette, Jeanette Petit-Pas-Taylor, and ask uh, that we do better uh, by them. Uh, please uh, write to uh, the minister, um, uh, Minister Quala, Carla Qualtro. I'm not sure what her full title is, but she takes care of um, uh, disabilities and inclusion uh, to try and uh, encourage her, uh, let her know that you, you definitely want the candidate with disability benefit to be more than 200 um, and to start increasing uh, as of like the following year that it becomes available. Um, and uh, as well, if you happen to be um, a fan of the Olympics and Paralympics, uh, Kits and Cubs, um, Devin Hru, when he was on our show, uh, told us about a campaign by uh, Wheelchair Basketball Canada uh, to raise some money by selling these really, really, really uh, groovy T-shirts here. So you see the front, Canada Wheelchair Basketball in the Paris 2024 uh, with a logo from Team Canada over here and the A in Paris made to look like uh, the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, it's a red t-shirt with Canada on white and wheelchair basketball on black underneath it. Uh, Paris 24, Paris is in black except for the Eiffel Tower in white in 2024 and white. Uh, it is a gorgeous shirt. Uh, it's only $35 Canadian. So if you go to uh, wheelchair-basketball-canada.deco, 
hyphen apparel dot com. <laughs> uh, that might be a bit of a mouthful, uh, but uh, please uh, do take some time to su- support our Paralympians and uh, do a little bit of democracy and get yourself a really stylish and snazzy T-shirt uh, to let Canadians know that you support our Paralympians. All right. Words of wisdom. Uh, huh. uh, don't play a grueling tennis match on a really, 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 really hot and humid day. I, I, <laughs> I guess uh, if I wanted something a little more meaningful. Um, let's see. What can I give you if I have something more meaningful? Um, there are times in life where, where things are going to get heavy. And I'm speaking here from personal experience because I'm go- going through a bit of a time like that myself. Uh, and you have to understand that for me, uh, it's not so much things for me personally that are, are heavy. There are some things, right? Uh, I, as, as you mentioned recently, I've had to make some changes uh, to um, uh, cut down the pace of life and the commitments because I was starting to feel overwhelmed and uh, it was causing uh, me to slip up uh, and make mistakes and let things fall through the cracks and sometimes be a little more grumpier and irritable than I normally am. Um, but when these situations arrive, um, it's really easy. And I saw it because it happened to my beaver sweetie, uh, to start reeling. Your mind starts going a mile a minute. Um, And you can't slow down long enough to think clearly, to plan, to strategize. And then at that point, each new curveball or each thing that doesn't go your way, no matter how small it is, becomes just one more thing on the pile and you start to accumulate. Um, It's always good to take moments in your life every now and then uh, to take a machete to your life and simplify Um, the values that you think you have. Um, sit there and, and question them. It's like, do I still hold this value? Do I need this value? Do I need this belief anymore? Um, and you can simplify a lot of things uh, and maybe learn uh, new patterns or new ways to deal with things. New, more not new patterns, but new ways to recognize patterns when they happen and to interrupt the pattern. Um, so when there comes a moment, because when there's a lot happening and there's a lot of over, a lot of feeling of being overwhelmed. One thing that really works for me is to, and it's hard to do in the moment, but it's to notice it's happening. Like my mind's going a mile a minute like this. Nothing good can come of this. So I need to stop. I need to slow everything down as slow as possible. And then I need to take my problem and I need to be able to look at it like it's something outside. From all angles, right? Need to be able to look at it. Yes. And once you start doing that, once you sort of get out of the reeling and you start of looking looking at your problem like it's an object, I guess, and trying to find the angle and trying, it sometimes can slow things down enough so that your next move isn't one that ends up generating more problems down the road. So um, sometimes uh, you're in a situation and you need to respond to an email or something. Um, And you might say things in a way that are a little inartful or delicate. You might say things um, about the story that you're telling yourself about what's going on, which are true to how you're feeling, uh, which may not actually be true. Like, for example, if you were felt that you were lied to somewhere along the way, were you lied to, or was it someone that told you something that was information that was incorrect because they too had incorrect information and there was no intention to deceive, right? And it's easy to go, I was lied to, and then just run with that. But when you take some time to actually like slow down and take this very emotional thing and put it through the rational filter, take all emotion out of it, and just look at it as a rational thing, is it? Like this, I'm feeling this. Is it rational that I'm feeling this? Well, because I'm hurt, yes. 
but logically, intellectually. Sometimes that allows you to slow down enough to make a better next move or to write that email that you're responding to in a little bit more of a neutral tone or to allow for the possibility that it might be something else than what you're telling you it, telling yourself that it is. Because sometimes it can be. And sometimes just that little moment, this, that moment to calm down or that moment to look at it in, from a different perspective. Because you can always go back to, to ruminating and reeling after if you want to. Right? Uh, but if that's a pattern you go to and it starts makes you, making you anxious, trying to look at the thing from outside as an object and then coming up. You don't have to come up with a plan or strategy to solve the next thing, the whole thing. Just the next move. And when the next move comes, you put something out there, you'll get something back, and that will allow you to know what the next move is. So try not to think about it of having to try to fix or resolve the whole situation or having to make the move and the decision that will fix it all, but just the one that will allow you to take the next step and remove a little bit of that load off your shoulders so that you can stress a little less. Right? Good decisions are usually not made when your mind is going fast. You need to strategize, and for that, you need to slow down. So um, hopefully that'll help uh, someone. Uh, again, have no background in this at all. Uh, it's just something that works for me. Hopefully it can work for you too. All right. Uh, from the Beaver Lodge, uh, it can be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. And um, huh, I don't know if I can, um, I'm going to, I guess, play some music to lead us out a bit. Uh, and uh, I will see if I have something Easter eggish for you. <laughs> this is really 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 weird uh try that so uh let's see music let's do this All right, <laughs> that's the best, the best I can do. I have no cock to keep. Uh, um, just a, a, a little bit of uh, news since uh, we're talking about, uh, and we will be talking a lot about Canadians who make us proud as uh, the Olympics and the Paralympic Games get closer and uh, get underway. But uh, we have a Canadian uh, who will be participating at the Olympics in cycling named J Derek G. Uh, in the road races, it was uh, currently competing in the Tour de France, the great, great, great road race, right? It's probably the biggest event in cycling. You could know nothing about the sport of cycling and you know of the Tour de France, at least. Um, well, somewhere along the way, uh, Mr. G picked up a third place in one of the stages of the race. And now after stage 17, 17 stages of the race, in the overall, the Classification Générale, the CG, uh, he is ranked number ninth in the entire race. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but this might be the best result from a Canadian, at least so far, in a Tour de France since Stephen Bauer finished fourth in the 80s. Uh, and this guy's uh, going to be going to the Olympics and uh, competing for Team Canada in uh some of the, I'm, I'm guessing probably mostly the road races versus uh, the track uh, for, uh, for us. Um, but yeah, uh, this is a, a Canadian that does well in the Tour de France. We've had uh, some Canadians uh, in the recent years win a stage here or there. Uh, but to be that high up uh, in the Classification Générale, in the top 10, and he has been for, uh, for a while now, uh, this might be uh, good. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully he's able to maintain it. Uh, that will definitely help give him a huge boost in his career. A top 10 at the Tour de France is really big. I think like over 160 cycl cyclists start. Uh, so it's a big deal. And yes, uh, he will be uh, competing uh, in uh, Paris in the road race and the time trial uh, for, uh, for Team Canada. And uh, yes, he's not on the track. So just the, the road races. So uh, a big congratulations to him. Uh, that's quite an achievement and an exploit. And also, if we are looking, there's uh, two other major tournaments going on uh, worldwide. Uh, there's the Pan American Cup of uh, Volleyball going on, uh, which I believe is a, a men's event. And uh, so far, after they're in pool play, after three matches, Canada is unbeaten, having defeated Puerto Rico 3-0, to zero, the United States 3-2, to two, and Mexico 3-0. to zero. Uh, So uh, it looks uh, very good for uh, Canada's chances to uh, advance to the playoffs there. And in basketball... Uh, there are world championships going on, I believe, for uh, women under 17, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Team Canada is also uh, participating in that event. Uh, making, trying to see here. Huh. And uh, last I had checked, Team Canada was doing pretty well as well. There we go. World championship under 17 women. Uh, we've gotten uh, to the playoffs. So uh, in the main round, uh, Canada was in Group D and finished in first place with uh, three wins and no losses, defeating Egypt, Chinese Taipei, and France. And now they're in the playoffs. And in the eighth of finals, they were playing Puerto Rico, defeated them 84-50, advanced to the quarterfinals where they will be playing Finland next. And if they win and everything goes, uh, everything goes according to seed, uh, and rankings, uh, they will be playing Spain, a very powerful nation, uh, in the semifinals. Uh, so there you go. That's what we have for our Easter egg, celebrating some Canadians who make us proud. And with that, kids and cubs, I think that it is time for me to do some magic. And um, let's see. Well, I don't have my wave magic wand, but I will. Oh, there we go. I will. Wave the magic nail file. One, two, three. Have a beaverific day. <laughs>